the 1st of September, 1939. Nazi Germany invades Poland, which marks the beginning of the Second World War. In May of the following year, the Germans establish Auschwitz concentration camp, located around 60 kilometers west of Krakow. The direct reason for the establishment of the camp is the fact that the mass arrests of Poles are increasing beyond the capacity of existing local prisons. Between 1940 and 1945, a minimum of 1.3 million people will be deported to Auschwitz, and of these, at least 1.1 million will be murdered. When on the 27th of January 1945, the Red Army enters Auschwitz, the Soviet soldiers liberate more than 7,000 surviving inmates, who are mostly ill and dying. The unspeakable conditions the liberators confront shed light on the full scope of Nazi horrors. One of the perpetrators of the criminal Nazi regime responsible for these atrocities is Maximilian Grabner. Maximilian Grabner was born on the 2nd of October 1905 in Vienna, then part of Austria-Hungary. He received no higher education, and in the 1920s he worked as a lumberjack. After brief police training, he joined the Austrian police in 1930, and worked first as a police officer and later as a criminal police officer at the police headquarters in Vienna. On the 1st of August 1932, Grabner joined the Nazi party. After Adolf Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany in January 1933, he fully intended to bring about an Austro-German Union. Beginning in May 1933, the Austrian Nazis waged a propaganda and terror campaign which was encouraged and funded by Germany. Their plan worked out in the spring of 1938, when Adolf Hitler annexed the federal state of Austria into the German Reich. The Anschluss, as it became known, took place over three days between the 11th and 13th of March 1938. Six months later, at the beginning of September 1938, Grabner joined the SS and rose to the rank of SS Untersturmführer, which was equivalent to second lieutenant. The Second World War began on the 1st of September 1939, when Nazi Germany invaded Poland. From November the same year, Grabner worked as a criminal secretary at the state police office in Polish Katowice, which was annexed by the German Reich. At the end of May 1940, he became head of the political department in the newly established Auschwitz concentration camp, as it was located in his police district. His position in the camp hierarchy was ambivalent, as on one hand he had to follow the disciplinary and administrative orders of the camp commandant, but on the other hand, he was only subordinate to his superior Gestapo departments in the performance of his official duties. His main duties included combating the camp resistance movement, preventing escapes and contacts with the outside world, compiling and managing prisoner files and corresponding with the Gestapo, criminal police, and the Reich security main office. In the camp, Grabner was known as arrogant and brutal. An example of his role in the camp is the investigation of the successful escape that took place on the 11th of July, 1940. The testimony about this event was given by former Polish prisoner Felix Miwik, who arrived in Auschwitz on the 14th of June, 1940, when Germans deported a group of 728 Poles from the prison in Tarnów to the Auschwitz concentration camp. It was the first transport of Poles to Auschwitz, and they received numbers from 31 to 758. Miwik said, Once the escape was noticed that occurred at 3 p.m., the entire camp was ordered to gather. At the time, it consisted of three blocks, which housed more or less 1,300 people. Our standing punishment commenced between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m., and lasted without pause until 3 p.m. the next day. Wanting to determine how the escaped prisoner, Tadeusz Wyjowski, had managed to escape and whether anyone knew something about his breakout, Grabner asked people who had information to come forward, promising that nothing untoward would happen to them. Initially, quite obviously, the prisoners did not believe him. However, when they learned that he was an Austrian, they started thinking that maybe they could trust him, and thus some individuals came forward, even though they knew nothing about the escape. Grabner promised that no harm would befall the prisoners who testified. However, he lied. Mira continued saying, Two SS men would hold the prisoner down on the buck. Grabner stood to the side and asked questions, while two other SS men hit the inmate with a whip, 
and a prisoner named Michalik wrote down his testimony. The inmates who testified, and there was a dozen or so of them, all died during the night. In fact, they knew nothing about Vyovsky's escape, but they wanted to help their friends who were standing in the cold without any food. We were not allowed to go to the toilet, while Grabne instructed the SS men to keep guard, threatening prisoners with a decimation and ordering them to perform knee bends and squats with their hands on their necks. Josef Kulish, who was imprisoned at Auschwitz from April 1943 until the 1st of October 1944, later testified, Sometime towards the end of 1943, I saw some torturers beat three women hanging upside down from the ceiling. These women were all soaked with water and beaten this way. I heard Grabner passing by and telling the torturers to carry on beating them in the same way. Kulish, who called Grabner a beast, then added, it was Grabner's custom that when he took one of the prisoners with him, he rode his bike, and the prisoner had to run after him. Another Auschwitz survivor, Rudolf Kowalewski, recalled that Maximilian Grabner was loyal to Rudolf Hess, the commandant of the Auschwitz concentration camp complex, and would often act as his deputy, especially when it came to torturing the prisoners. To welcome their victims in the camp, Grabner and Hess ordered 25 lashes, and as a farewell gift, following great agony in the Auschwitz camp, when transferring the victim sentenced to death to a different camp, 75 lashes, until their flesh came off their bones. Grabner's staff carried out the intensified interrogations he ordered on suspected prisoners, during which they were systematically tortured and then imprisoned in the bunker of Block 11. Together with a protective custody camp commander, he carried out so-called bunker emptying, during which inmates were arbitrarily shot in the courtyard between blocks 10 and 11 at the death wall, where the SS men shot several thousand people. On one occasion, a woman who was tortured in block 11 was to be shot at the death wall. However, she was not wounded by the gunfire because she fell after losing consciousness due to the shock and fear. Because the crematorium was overloaded, her body and the other corpses were put to one side to be burnt in the evening. When in the evening the woman regained consciousness and started to beg to have her life spared, Grabner was informed about the situation by a guard who was present in the crematorium. Grabner came over immediately and shot the woman with his own revolver. The aforementioned prisoner, Felix Miwik, later recalled how in 1942, the prisoners, mainly Silesians, were sentenced to death by shooting and Grabner assisted in the killing. After the executions, Grabner gave an order to classify prisoners' deaths as natural in post-mortem reports and documents, while phlegmon and typhoid fever were used as camouflage. From 1942, when selections of mass Jewish transports took place at Auschwitz-Birkenau, Grabner gave speeches to Jews destined for gassing to calm them down. He called on the people to undress for bathing so that they could then eat and take up work in the camp. However, they were all murdered instead. Once, 250 Jewish men, women and children were to be killed in a gas chamber. During a gassing, Pellets of Zyklon B had to be thrown down through both openings of the gas chamber room at the same time. Two guards were required to do this, but on this occasion, only one of them showed up. Grabner immediately asked the other SS man to throw the pellets of Zyklon B into the opening, killing all 250 innocent people inside. On another occasion, a capo of the Zoller Commando, which was a unit of camp's prisoners forced to help with the disposal of gas chamber victims, asked Grabner to provide him with one more inmate because one prisoner had died. Grabner replied that he could not give him one inmate, but could give him five prisoners instead on one condition. The capo would have to kill four other prisoners in his unit. Grabner then asked the capo how he was beating the other inmates, and when he showed Grabner the rubber truncheon, Grabner grabbed an iron rod and explained to the capo that he should beat the prisoners with such a rod instead. Though in September 1942, Grabner was awarded the War Merit Cross second class with swords, one year later on the 30th of November 1943, he was relieved of his position as head of the political department in the Auschwitz concentration camp and arrested. After several months in prison, Grabner was brought to trial before the SS and police court in Weimar. Grabner, who had come to the attention of SS judge Georg Konrad Morgan, was accused of carrying out the arbitrary shooting of 2,000 prisoners for whom there were no execution orders. 
In addition, Grabner, whose duties as head of the political department also included combating theft and corruption, had enriched himself to a considerable extent. Instead of fighting theft and corruption, Grabner was accused of having enriched himself to a considerable extent by plundering the possessions of murdered Jews, which were considered property of the Third Reich, but Grabner had them sent to his apartment in Vienna. Morgan requested a prison sentence of 12 years for aggravated theft and murder in at least 2,000 cases. However, Heinrich Miller, the head of the Gestapo, refused to cooperate in clarifying the facts of the case, so the trial was adjourned and never concluded. Grabner was sent back to the Gestapo in Katowice and finally to Wroclaw, both in German-occupied Poland. After the war, Grabner went into hiding near Vienna, disguised as a farmhand. On the 4th of August 1945, he was arrested while working in the fields and detained in Soviet custody at the Vienna police prison. In 1946, Grabner testified in prison saying, I only participated in the murder of three million people out of consideration for my family. I was never an anti-Semite. In January 1947, materials were found during a cell check which indicated that Grabner was preparing an escape. The same year, he was extradited to Poland where he was tried at the Auschwitz trial, which began on the 24th of November 1947 and lasted one month. During the trial, one of the witnesses was Marian Golinski, who in the spring of 1943 worked for four or five months at Auschwitz-Birkenau as a bricklayer, building the crematorium chimneys. He said the following, When I worked at Auschwitz-Birkenau, almost every day I witnessed as both suspects, that is, Maximilian Grabner and Herbert Paul Ludwig, were abusing prisoners who were at work by beating them with batons or simply with revolvers for no reason, to the point that almost everyone fell to the ground bleeding. People were being beaten every day, the whole time that I worked in the camp. I cannot estimate the number of people who were beaten because the beatings occurred almost constantly. I would like to stress, Grabner and Ludwig terrorized the camp so much that whenever a prisoner was summoned to the political department to be interrogated by them, hardly anyone would go, because fearing torture, the majority committed suicide. On the 22nd of December 1947, the Polish Supreme National Tribunal in Krakow found Grabner guilty of crimes against humanity and sentenced him to death by hanging. One month later, on the 24th of January 1948, when guards in Montelupich prison in Krakow came to collect him for execution, Grabner, who had once enjoyed killing people for sport, cowardly kneeled before the officers, trying to kiss their boots and begging for mercy. However, this pathetic display did not save him. When Grabner died on the gallows, he was 42 years old. There were no tears shed for Maximilian Grabner. Thanks for watching the World History Channel. Be sure to like and subscribe, and click the bell notification icon so you don't miss our next episodes. We thank you, and we'll see you next time on the channel.